um, I approached this topic by Googling. So I thought, what sort of does the internet have to tell me about um, what can I talk to advertising strategists about attention? And this is what, I, what came up, like right on the first page. So this is um, a report by Microsoft Research, apparently. Consumer Insight, specific for Canada, though. I'm not quite sure how appropriate that is here, but we can talk about that later. And that um, report specifically deals with the idea. So it's a research report on the idea that our attention spans are shortened, that people do not have the same capacity anymore as they used to have uh, in the last years. And the report starts with this really nice and really ingenious graphs. Uh, so comparing uh, the attention span of us which apparently has reduced to eight seconds since 2000 from 12 seconds to the uh, attention span of a goldfish, which is nine seconds. So we are now have an attention span apparently that is shorter than the goldfish. Uh, and that's sort of, I find that quite convincing at first, but then when I think about it, um, maybe not so much anymore. Because if we really had an attention span of nine seconds, like how would I be even be, um, driving anywhere, how would I be able to give this talk? I mean, let alone talking for 15 minutes. It would be all very, very incoherent. So there is something, not quite sure what is meant here by attention span. And my worries start even more increase, become even stronger when I look at um, the way the research was conducted and what these sorts of ideas are based on. Um, and this is an example. So apparently this involved both uh, neurological and methodological uh, and um, questionnaire data. And what they did, they put these people in a room and exposed them to various different tasks and they had to do lots of screens at the same time and then they had put on these sorts of machines here which are sort of, which I know, which are sort of um, measures to record electrical activity. And then the final uh, solution of the report is, in terms to neural readings, is that these new readings show that high usage of social media increases short bursts of high attention, which um, the research report concludes somehow is uh, indicative of that light social media use increases our ability to change quick attentions. Uh, now, I'm not going to bore you by sort of going through every single detail. What is wrong with this report? I'm just going to say one thing. That is, that these sorts of machines, which are indeed um, electroencephalograms, as I would call them, so measures that can pick up electrical activity, these sorts of mobile ones, which you can sort of often buy everywhere, which looks like these ones will be used here, they are incredibly, incredibly sensitive to simple, neuro to simple electrical signals that, that, that are produced by your muscles rather than your brain. So what this graph probably reflects is that people who were with moderate social media use more chewing, more chewing gum or something like that. <laughs> um, but it's sort of a little bit unfair also to judge the report like that, because at the same time, what this report, um, that there, there are a number of really uh, nice and important findings in there. For example, one of them is that um, they say that multitasking really doesn't differ between genders. So we all have this prejudices that women are better than multitasking than men, which is a complete lie, which was invented by bosses to tell their secretaries who want to take their job and to keep them in their places. So there's nothing true about that, and the report states that very nicely. But um, what this report really is about and what is actually good and what's important to emphasize is, is that it is very good at communicating and creating an interest into the topic of you know, how people attribute attention over time um, to various tasks. And it is very catchy and it creates a lot of interest in the topic and that's why it gets much more media attention than this work here, which is perhaps the single most important a uh, research article on selective attention ever written, which is from 1980 and by Anne Treisman, who is hugely influential. Everything we know about selective attention is based on perhaps this particular article. But I guess the point that I'm making here is that we as academics certainly need to get better at presenting our stuff because no one's, the BBC is not gonna come and write an article about this unless I explain it to him, but they're gonna come and focus on the goldfish which I completely understand, I would too. So what is the element 
of this particular idea about what is a useful way of think about, to think about our attention, or how do we think in cognitive psychology or neuroscience about attention? Well, Anne Triesman invented this ingenious paradigm, which is basically a way to find out which task, whatever task it is, require attention and which ones don't. So which sorts of cognitive operations in your brain require you to put mental effort into it and which ones don't. And it's a super simple task. So let's say you get an array of these at that time because it was the 80s, they don't have computers, so it was all printed on cards which were handed out to people. Luckily, we don't need to do this anymore. So now we have computers who can do that for us. Um, it's all about like finding the odd one out. So if you have an array of these sorts of blue bars, find the red one. Pretty simple, not hard to find. Same for this one. Again, you have an array of very similar shapes which are different only in one aspect, and in this case, that's orientation. And, and Treisman calls this the pop-out effect. So if within an array of things, things differ within only one dimension, they pop out at you. And this is another example from my own research. One of the most powerful uh, features that pop out at you visually is um, motion. And this is just one example, which I should have pressed now. So immediately, the sort of the movement of the people, and when I move forward the video, so it's a lot of my research is about these sorts of movement things. Um, groups are formed in your visual system very easily the moment people start moving together. When they do, you visually form a group. So again, that's something that doesn't require attention at all. It's something that comes very easy to you. Now, let's compare that now to an array like this. Now, who can find the odd one out? That's a little bit more complicated now. So the odd one out is exactly as the, uh, I can't find it right now, it's the red one leaning to the left. So it's here. So what Treisman found or demonstrated with this sort of example is that the moment an object, whatever it is, whether it's a sound or something visual or something you touch, is defined by more than one features, you need attention to find it. And that is a really, really great way of determining how much effort is required or is effort required. So this is relevant for multitasking because basically, whatever, I, you know, if you're sleeping, I can wake you up in the middle of the night and show you the sorts of bars and says, show me the odd one out. And you're always going to be able like there. And you can do five million other things at the same time. It won't matter. You can always do it. With this one, if I do that to you, and you're sort of sitting on your computer and working and multitasking, you're going to do it probably once, and you're going to do it twice, and then you're going to tell me to bugger off with this sort of strange uh, displays that you're seeing here, because you don't have the time for it, and you have other things to do. So using this paradigm helps us to define what actually multitasking is about. And once we have done that, oh no, one important thing that I need to focus on, obviously, the key thing of this task is, is that it is more difficult the more things there are. So for this one, it's very easy. When there are lots of distractors or like things that take attention away from it, it's harder. And that doesn't happen for the first task, which was just one feature. So that's the basic thing. It's super simple, that's all. And this is what it uh, then shows. So this is from the 1980s paper, so again, for when you have parallel search, so when you have things that differ in only one feature, it doesn't matter how many bars distract me from it, I'm always equally fast in finding it. The moment um, objects are defined by more than one feature, the size of the array that I'm looking in starts to matter. And the larger the array is, the more difficult it becomes. Now that's the basic finding. Now we know why that is. Well, the reason is because our brain is organized in such a way as to process all these features independently. So we have brain areas that care about the orientation of visual stimuli. We also have brain areas that care specifically about color. We have brain areas that care specifically about movement and brain areas for objects and for people's faces and bodies. So all of these things are very easily processed in parallel by us. Now the question now for relevant to this talk is do we get better at this? So that's the thing that we're really interested in. We want to know 
if the world is getting ever more complicated, can we get faster at dealing with it together with the world? So if the world becomes faster, can we adjust? And this is the simplest way in showing, yes, we can. So this graph shows you, people do these sorts of all these visual search tasks with multiple compared things, and they do it for one day, for seven hours. You know, you have to pay people, you have to pay people a lot of money to do that, or you get poor students who get research credits for these things at universities these days. But anyway, they do that for hours, and they get better on day one, on day two, and then there are a few more days in between, and at day seven and day eight, they are much, much faster. So they went back from searching for two seconds to down to eight seconds. So this is good news, because it means that even if the worlds get faster and the tasks get difficult, we can adjust. We can get faster, too. Now, the problem with it, the problem is, is what happens um, here. So if we look at, if we remember, the idea was that when something is parallel, when something is really easy, it doesn't matter how many distracting things there are. And what you see is, even though people get faster, the sort of slope or like the increase of it stays roughly the same. And that has very important implications because it means that people do not really get faster at allocating their attention somewhere. They get better at pressing buttons, they get better at all these sorts of stages, but the actual act of distributing your attention about multiple things stays the same because it gets, it is equally difficult for when it's, um, when you've done it a lot and when you don't. The effect of how many different things you have to do still matters in the same way and still makes things more difficult. Now to return our secretary to um, illustrate that a little bit more, so the sexist boss who tells, who doesn't give her the better job because uh, she thinks she's not she's very good at multitasking and he can't do it, um, says she's very good at multitasking. Now what this graph shows is that perhaps she's not very good at multitasking, she's just incredibly good at typing. So what people are not good at is sharing attention. She's a very bad multitasker. What she's very good at is doing the stuff that she's doing, so that means she has more attention available for other things, hmm? which is a very important distinction because it has consequences for how we address and what we ask from people when the world gets faster. And you, could, you only need to look at like, um, like areas where it really, really matters. So what would you do in places like, for example, a nuclear power plant where you really, things, cannot allow, things are not allowed to go wrong? So how do you structure an environment in a place where things are not, to go, are not allowed to go wrong and yet people have to do a lot and lots of things? You do it in a way as to allow for parallel search. So all of these buttons and displays and things are organized in such a way that they differ in primary colors, that they differ in orientation, so that the person who has to survey the actual nuclear plant does not need to multitask, that it's all popping out at him or her. And the same uh, appears to these buttons. So what does that mean overall? So what can I take home from that? The, what you can take home from that is that rather than putting us under the stress of sort of saying, gosh, I need to get better at doing five million things at once, probably it's the realization that we were never particularly good at doing multiple things at once, and we also don't get much better at doing multiple things at once. What we do get better at is the task that we are actually doing. We do get better at um, typing. We do get better at um, solving problems. We do get faster at writing emails, but what we don't get better at is mixing all of these things together. And uh, um, that means, ultimately, we need to simplify our environment. And this is not a simplification of our environment, but this is more an example of how the aesthetics of simplification uh, feed in to our overall world because everything gets so much more complicated. So I find it interesting to see that so these are logos from Starbucks and Google Chrome in this case over the years that they also have gone through simplification, somehow mirroring this sort of need or sort of uh, wish of us to simplify our environment and not to have so many things going on at the same time. I promised to Bogdana, and then I'm going to finish, that I'm not going to talk badly about digital media, but I'm going to take, uh, so I'm going to finish with two things. So the first of all, the main challenge 
um, for digital media in this ever-fasting environment is not so much um, that it's all getting faster. The problem is that it is all far too reliant on one channel only, which is visual. And that means that pop-out and these sort of multiple tasks can't really happen because everything is pushed into this one channel. And this is the reason why the book is still, or this is perhaps one of the reasons why texts become shorter and shorter. Because if I have a book, it's not so much that reading nowadays, reading on a tablet is not necessarily harder than reading from a book. But the book, because it has a weight and because it has pages, gives you an immediate feeling of how far you are. And that is not happening on any sort of uh, reader. That is not happening. Or if it does, it gives you an indication of where the page is, which is also visual. So like the immediate sense of how far have I read does not exist in, in um, digital media. But it does exist in a book, because I can take it. Like one way I can think about it is, you know, let's say the tablet computer would change weight depending on how far I have read. That would be a way of implementing it. But we are far, still far away from doing that. And just to close for Bogdana, it is the problem is not the digital media itself. In fact, playing computer games is really good for you. So this is an example from a study from um, the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. They show that just playing you know, for a couple of weeks Super Mario can have super beneficial effects in your brain. So it increases sort of fine motor skills. It increases spatial orientation and all these sorts of kin. The problem is not the computer. The problem is how do we do try is us trying to do all these things at the same time thank you very much thank you.